Next, let's read it, and then we'll, we'll pray. If you will open your Bibles or your favorite app to uh, James 2, and we're in verses 14 through 26. James 2, 14 through 26, and you probably have a title similar to Faith and Works. It says, What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but does not have works? Can such a faith save him? If a brother or sister is without clothing or lacks daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, stay warm, and be well fed, but you do not give what the body needs, what good is it? In the same way, if, it does, if faith does not have works, it is dead by itself. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without works and I will show you faith by my works. You believe that God is one good, even the demons believe and they shudder. Senseless person, are you willing to learn that faith without works is useless? Wasn't Abraham our father justified by works in offering Isaac the son on the altar? You see that faith was active together with his works, and by his works, faith was made complete. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. And he was called God's friend. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. In the same way, wasn't Rahab the prostitute also justified by works in receiving the messengers and sending them out by a different route? For just as the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. Will you pray with me? Lord, um, I just ask you to speak through me today that um, our congregation would hear your truth, not mine. Um, I ask that you give me the wisdom to speak clearly and to send the message that you would have everyone here listen. Each one of us are here for a reason. We're not here by accident. You have us right where we are, and you know where we stand, what kind of baggage we brought in today, how our day has been, how our week has been, how our month or our year has gone. And you know what each one of us need to hear today. So, Lord, I just pray that this message would be well received and that we would get a glimpse of your truth and your holiness. In your name we pray. Amen. So today we're going to talk about a faith that works. I want to begin by bringing all of us back to a fond memory that we have growing up. Something that you used to do that was make-believe. Maybe... You used to play tea parties, and you really thought that there was delicious hot tea being poured into your cup, and that the Queen of England was oh so happy to be sitting with you and all your stuffed animals. I illustrated that to Emily at first, and she's like, hey, I never played that. I played kitchen. And I was like, well, th isn't that the same thing? And she said, no, I was the runner. Like, I owned the kitchen. I was an entrepreneur. I made money. I took the orders, and I made sure that everybody was satisfied. So if you didn't do the tea party thing, maybe you were more like Emily and you're an entrepreneur. I am a huge Star Wars fan. So for me, I always liked to pretend to be a Jedi. I went to this summer camp, and around this time, The Phantom Menace had just come out, and I was nine, so I was stoked. Uh, me and my friends loved the movies, and of course, we all wanted to be Jedis. We would go out in search of sticks, I mean uh, lightsabers, and we would duel each other. So these were really big sticks, and we would get bruises. <laughs> I would come home, and my mom's like, isn't this a Christian camp? Why are you getting hurt and coming back with bruises from this Christian camp? Um, we had ranks like Padawan, Apprentice, Master, and Lord. We even had a method to grow in these ranks by fighting, using the Force, overthrowing our masters. Uh, this was kind of before Christ in our life, so of course we were Sith. Anybody that would watch us would have known that we truly believed we could become Jedi Masters. We could own the Force. We had a faith in these movies, and our faith was visible. James is going to explain that there is a contrast between works and faith, and that in some way they should be working together to make your faith visible. But first, why should they go together? 
Faith and works, James says, should be a complement. We're looking at verses 14 through 17. He says, But someone will say to you, You have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. James grabs the listener's attention with a huge blow by first questioning their salvation. Can such a faith save him? He asks. Now our ears perk up because like a lot of his listeners, some of us got into this Christian game looking for heaven, searching for a way to be saved. We want to be saved, don't we? Some people might brush over this text and claim that the Bible holds inconsistencies like I said before, with Paul. Paul preaches in Ephesians 2.8 that we are saved by faith. Well, here James says that we are saved by works. So who's right? If James is negating the saving work of faith, then we ought to throw out all of James or all of Paul's writing because the two are obviously contradicting each other, right? Why is it in the canon? If there's anything that we know about studying Scripture, it's that words matter. Even the smallest words or smallest structures in a sentence can completely change the meaning. For example, I'm not an English major, but my wife is. And over the years, I've learned just how important sentence structure is. Facebook is one of the areas that really grinds her gears. (laughs) She'll read a post out to me and yell at you guys, but to me, (laughs) about about sentence structure and and the spelling of words, like there can mean many different things if you add the apostrophe or don't add that last E. There's a lot of things that you can do wrong in grammar. She gets really upset if you forget an Oxford comma. There's just a lot of things that you can do wrong. Even things as small as a comma do completely change the meaning of a sentence. Let's say, for example, you said the sentence, let's eat, comma, Grandma, in this scenario, you might be having a nice steak and potatoes dinner at your grandma's house. But if you omit the comma, something dramatically different is happening. Let's eat grandma is, (laughs) your situation has taken a turn for the worse. (laughs) One small thing can make a sentence dramatically different. So let's look closely at what James is saying here. In verse 14, he says, what good is it? So we need to ask ourselves, is he questioning faith? What good is faith? Or is he questioning the type of faith? If we look closely at the text, it says, can such faith save him? Depending on the translation you have, maybe yours says, can that faith save him? He's not saying that faith can save. He's, he's pointing out a, compl- uh, a specific type of faith. There's this or there's that. There's an option here. There are types of faith. So James is not questioning whether faith saves. He is questioning whether their faith is real. What kind of faith do you actually have? So I'll ask you, church, not if you have faith, but what sort of faith do you have? He gives us examples in verses 15 through 16. He starts out with something very simple, a person without food or clothing. If we give them warm wishes and we have um, done nothing for them, has our faith amounted to anything in this situation? Our faith has proven instead to be useless. It is not useful. To use James' language in verse 17, he says, in the same way, faith, if it does not have works, is dead by itself. Without works, James says, our faith is dead. I'm not really into plants, but my wife has taken up the hobby recently. Um, It was kind of a rough start in the beginning. We had to let a few go. But we learned from our mistakes. Each plant needs a balance of both water and sunlight in order to live. Similarly, we need to have faith and works in order to be alive. A plant given too much light and not enough water will die and fade away. The sun will scorch its leaves and leave it hot and dry. The plant will essentially shut down. Photosynthesis will cave when the environment is too hot and there's not enough water to cool down the plant or to circulate nutrients. 
On the other hand, if you give it too much water and not enough sun, it will drown. It will have no air in the soil in order to process the nutrients, and the flowers will begin to wilt. Either way, your plant is dead. James says that in a similar fashion, our faith could be dead. If we cannot show a balance of faith and works, it is dried or drowned like the plant. We hear James, and he thinks that faith should complement works. They need to be in balance with one another, and we're going to see uh, an objection and a rebuttal in verses 18 through 26. This is where James is staking his claim. He came prepared, expecting his audience to come back with some sort of argument. The objector says in verse 18, Some will say, You have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. Does this sound familiar to us? Maybe today we don't hear these exact words, but we hear things like it. Maybe you've heard things like, what's true for you doesn't have to be true for me. Maybe you've heard, don't tell me what to believe. Or, you do me, I'll do you. Or wait, you do you, I'll do me. <laughs> like the grandma story, words matter. <laughs> that was a very different example. <laughs> you do you, I'll do me. You've probably heard that. And I think it's a product of our current society. We uh, do live in a modern, uh, postmodernistic society that finds truth to be limiting, narrow-minded, and subjective. For many of us, we probably know that friend that is difficult to convince when they say things like this. But I want to see here that this is not a new problem. James obviously dealt with this. And uh, We've always had to deal with people who reject truth claims. And here, we're going to see how to address that person. James asks the objector in 18 to show your faith without works. He's saying, how can you possibly do it? Is faith a physical thing that you can hold and hand over to me? It's not. So how can you prove to me that you have that faith that you say you have? In verse 19, James says, you believe that God is one good, even the demons believe and they shudder. He's basically saying, if you cannot prove your faith, you're no better than the demons be um, who believe, because look at them. They shudder at the name of Jesus, and they do nothing about it. Can we prove our faith? James is saying, without doing something, no. How can I know for sure that your faith is real? Where's the evidence? James says. I want to take a minute with you to do a little imagination experiment. You can either take out your phone or envision it in your head, whatever works best for you. I've got a couple questions for you. Number one, do you believe that your phone has GPS? Everyone's head is shaking unless, you know, you're living back in the 90s. You probably do have GPS, All right? Question number two, with, uh, if you wanted to, could you take me out for a nice steak lunch after church by Googling an address near here? Yes. Now, I want you to envision holding your phone out in front of you. The screen is off without moving your fingers, without speaking to it. Siri is cheating. I want you to find the nearest steak place with the highest rating within five miles of here. Anyone find it? Why can't we? You've told me that you have the capability in your phone. Why can't we do it? I appreciate you all for thinking that you have GPS on your phone, but you have proven nothing to me. I have no idea if your phone has Google. I have no idea if your phone has GPS. You just say that you do. If you do not put on your data, enter a location, your phone is useless. It is dead. It might as well have no charge. It won't work unless you do something to it. Our faith is the same way. James is saying that you can talk all you want about your faith, but where is the proof? Obviously, just believing in something is not good enough. So we know that faith and works ought to go together. We've heard now an argument and a rebuttal against it. And finally, we're going to see some examples of how faith can be put into action. 
Abraham is our first example that we see in verses 21 through 23. The objector has been heard, and James has made the claims, and now he's going to back it up with Scripture. And some of us might be thinking, whoa, 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 Abraham? Abraham is our example of works? If I asked you, what would you say? Abraham is a man of faith. Most of us probably have this idea that he is a man of faith, and even James admits that he is. In verse 23, he says, Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. And I don't know if you all call, uh, caught it, but in the call and response earlier today, I think Ng in, put the applicable text to, to mind because it was another text that said, Abraham believed and it was credited to him as righteousness. You all said it today. So why is James using Abraham as an example if belief is what we all know Abraham to be about? In James, he is quoting Genesis 4.6. And what happens in Genesis is that Abraham has promised a son. Him and Sarah are extremely old, so old that Sarah laughs at God. So it seems very unlikely. But however, Abraham believes. We see in Galatians 3.9 also that those who have faith are blessed with Abraham who had faith. And we see again in Romans 4.3, the same text, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. So time and time again we see that Abraham is a man of faith. Now if we stop here, we're going to wonder, what is James talking about? Why is he quoting this passage to prove his point? But just before this statement, James says another uh, interesting sentence. In verse 21, he said, Wasn't Abraham our father justified by works when he offered his son Isaac on the altar. You see, that son that he was promised when he was really old, he had to wait for that son. Eventually, him and Sarah did conceive. His name was Isaac. And can you imagine the joy of waiting your entire life? And remember, like Old Testament times, lives were a bit longer than ours, right? He waited a long time to get this son. The joy that he must have had when Isaac finally came. And could you imagine the sorrow of being asked by God for a sacrifice? So what does Isaac do? Sorry, what does Abraham do? He offers his son because God had asked him to. God was putting Abraham's faith to work. What would you do in that moment? Would you shy away and say, no, God, this is mine. I don't want to give it up to you. Or would you act in faith? When we read about Abraham in the text, we don't see a man of belief and nothing else. We see a man who takes action. He puts his money where his mouth is. He is a faith. His faith is a faith that is alive. James explains in verse 20, uh, 22 that you see that his faith was active together with his works, and by his works, faith was perfected. So faith is perfected by works. It is faith that led Abraham to believe that his son would be okay no matter what God asked of him. In fact, Abraham believed so much so that he actually thought his son was going to die. He didn't think God was going to stop him. If you go back to the text and study it, you'll find out that God... or um, Abraham thought that his son was going to be resurrected. That's the kind of faith that he had in God. Abraham is not just a man of faith, but a man of works. And he puts his faith into action. Like a plant full of life, Abraham is full of both the living water and also the holy son. His faith was balanced. We see in Abraham faith being put into action, a faith that is alive, a living, working faith. And because of his actions, because of his works, God sees the reality of his faith. He can say it is genuine, and it validates his righteousness. James comes prepared with another example, Rahab. In verse 25, it says, In the same way, wasn't Rahab, the prostitute, also justified by works in receiving the messengers and sending them out by a different route? The story of Rahab goes back to Joshua. 
chapter 2, verse 1 through 24. You don't have to turn with me. I'll, I'll summarize it for you. Basically, Joshua sends spies into Jericho. They're scouting out the land to figure out what they're going to do next. They take refuge in Rahab's house. These two spies go into her house. She doesn't know these guys, but there's something about them that leads her to help. Someone in the town saw, so they tell the king, and the king and his men scout out the situation. Rahab hides these two men in their house, and when the guards come and knock, she lies. She says, I don't know who those guys were. They've already left. I don't know where they're going. Guys, she could have been killed for lying to the king and his men, but she acted instead. She was courageous because of her faith in the Lord. And she gives them a safe place to escape the city. But before she does, she acknowledges that she knew somehow that the Lord was with them, and that's why she acted in their favor. We know then that Rahab's belief in Yahweh was why she chose to act, to put her uh, faith to work. And later in Joshua 6, we find out that the city's being burned, um, everything is being destroyed, and Rahab's uh, family is actually saved from that by Joshua because he saw righteousness in her. So we see a literal act of someone being saved by their faith being put into works. We conclude in verse 26. For just as the body without the spirit is dead, also faith without works is dead. We've heard claims made by James. We've heard examples proving it to to be true. We've heard his rebuttal against someone objecting. James contends that both faith and works go hand in hand. One without the other is ineffective. It's useless. It might as well be dead. My brothers and sisters, are you, are you like one of those plants? Maybe your faith is not as alive as we once thought. Maybe you are like the overwatered plant. Do you feel like drowning? Are you so full of hope and big ideas, but you're never working to make those visions become a reality? Are you so full of water, but you're never pouring into others? Are you afraid that you're going to be burned? Maybe you go to every Bible study. Maybe you go to every MCG. Maybe you're sitting here every single Sunday, soaking up the word. But maybe you're also sitting in the shade. If you're drowning, I encourage you to move into the light. Volunteer in places that you know you can be effective in the church. Be patient with that person at work that bothers you. Husbands and wives, devote time to serving each other. Pour into the people in your life. And maybe this doesn't describe you. Maybe that situation is foreign because maybe you're the dried up plant. Maybe you're so overburdened with labor that you feel like you are withering away and you're tired. Is it because you have nothing to sustain you? Nothing lifting your spirit up? Nothing to draw from? Are you so invested in seeking the sunlight that you forget that you need living water? just as much to refresh your roots. Be honest with yourselves. Are you working so hard because you love Jesus that much? Or are you working out of obligation or because you enjoy the spotlight? If you're working out of obligation, you will be more and more like a dried up leaf. You will fall away from the church. You will feel like there's no hope for you, frustrated that you keep serving, but you feel no heart change. You might be dehydrated or drowning. And my question is, what, do you, what are we doing about it? In 2 Timothy 4.7, Paul talks about finishing the race and keeping the faith. Like trying to win our spiritual race, um, it will be impossible if we only have part of this equation, part of works or part of faith. It's like trying to win the Tour de France with a bicycle that has one pedal. You would struggle to build up any momentum and probably crash on the side of the road before too long. To finish, we must have all of the parts. And we will not finish well if we only have part of what is required. Works finalizes the equation. It completes the machine. It finishes the outfit. Works is the other pedal of the bike that we need in order to finish our race. I was thinking a lot while studying this about um, just people that have been influencers um, 
in our society as a whole and then personally. And Martin Luther King Jr. came up a lot in my mind. No doubt he is a man that showed that he believed what he believed through his actions. He led wave after wave of protester outcries against political and social injustice. He inspired nonviolent crime, or sorry, nonviolent activist activism in order to bring out justice for all. And we hear his desire for justice in his I Have a Dream speech. It'll be a short quote, I promise. He states, I have a dream that my four children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. He's fighting for justice, and he's not sitting at home doing nothing about it. It's plain to see where his heart is, because his actions showed. He worked for it. He had a faith that worked hard, and he had a great impact. Or maybe there's someone who personally has affected your life like this. Most often, this happens not because they shy away from a world and keep their faith a secret, but they engage in your personal life. They open up to us, and, uh, and they do so in a world that tells them vulnerability is weakness. No doubt it takes courage. For me, it was a mentor and personal friend who has recently died. Uh, Tim was his name, and he invested so much time and energy into every person around him that uh, if you had asked his family, they would admit that was his fatal flaw because he wouldn't spend time on himself. But it's these kind of people that make it quite clear um, that they believe in Jesus because of the way that they live. Sorry, I've got allergies or dust in my eye or something. <laughs> they make it quite clear what they believe in by their actions. These people are great examples of how you put your faith to work, but there's even a, a greater example set for us by Jesus. Christ, because he had great belief, has done the most and left the greatest impact. Jesus, Jesus even admits that the thing that we must do as believers is to believe. We see in John 6.29, the work of God is this, to believe in the one whom he has sent. In the next verse, we see the disciples ask, what will you do that we may believe? Essentially, they're saying, Jesus, we hear you talking about faith, but we want you to prove it. So Jesus gets busy. At an early age, he begins learning in the synagogues. He prays and reads fervently, and he challenges those who misuse the scripture. He destroys the tables of those sinning in the temple. He heals the sick, gives sight to the blind, makes the cripple walk, and makes the broken whole. He weeps with those who suffer and mourns over the death of, death of loved ones, and he gives away for the lost, joins the lonely, and he suffers to a point of death on the cross do you see that Jesus was a man who put his faith to work? Jesus is our greatest example because his faith was completed by works. Brothers and sisters, will you put your faith to work? If you truly believe in what Jesus had done for you, will you show it in your actions? It's no coincidence that in chapter 3, James begins to talk about controlling your tongue. No doubt it's easy for us to say that we believe, but do our actions really show it? Are we spitting out Christianese in order to impress those around us, hoping that if we fool just enough people, we might even begin to trick ourselves? Or maybe you're trying to trick God into believing that your faith is real too. Is your faith a faith that works? As we prepare for communion and the band will uh, slowly come up on the stage, I want us to reflect on our lives and how we are living. And I ask you, are you living for yourself or are you living for Jesus? Are we going to go through the motions or do we actually believe in him so much that our lives are changed? 
And I mean real change, like observable. People can tell that you are a different person. Will we spend some time singing and, and maybe praying for a little bit? Or are we really going to take this as our own and own it? So I want us to reflect on that it's a personal question, obviously. But as we come up to receive the cup and the bread, just think about how your life exudes Christ and, and really honestly ask yourself, have I experienced that change to evidence my faith? Um, you can, when you're ready, the band will be playing. Um, just pray, and when you're ready, you can come up the middle and go out to the sides and, and take the elements and, and go, back, go and sit back down.